Hi, this is J.P. Morgan and Lars Lindstrom. Hi. And this is? Trench from the Trenches. Trench from the Trenches. Stay tuned. Hi, this is J.P. Morgan and... Lars Lindstrom. And we're here for Trends from the Trenches for the month of September. It's September oh, already. Oh, I was, I was like July. <laughs> I just about said July. No, it is September. Oh, September man. September is what here. What year is it? What year is it? Are we in? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I'm thinking. We're going to be changing the year in no time here. Oh, man. Do you know what I hate about California in What's September? That? How blazing it's the hottest hot it is. month of the year. It's oh, like you dude. think it should be fall and leaves and starting to be October. Our heat here goes way into October. It's like 103 man. degrees yeah, yesterday. It was crazy. It was crazy. So here we are whining. It's like in California. Cold, cold, cold. What was it? 68 <laughs> degrees? <laughs> We're dying out here. <laughs> we can't handle it. Oh so, gosh. So what's going on in the world of photography and video? It's it's that uh, it's that awkward month where people aren't really sure what's going on. There's a lot of speculation <laughs> of things to come, but there and there's lots of announcements, but there's not really anything that's hit the stores, hit the shelves yet. You know what I mean? There are a couple of things. Yeah. Oh yeah. The A7. Uh, uh, the A7R. R2. R2. Is a huge thing. We're going to talk about that a lot yeah. today. We're going to talk about uh, that. We're going to make a little comparison between that and the. Uh, 5D RS. Uh, 5D SR. 5D RS. That and the 5, is it the R? I don't remember. What is it, 5D SR? <laughs> I don't remember. It's 5D SR. It's 5D okay. SR. All right. So we're going to make a comparison between the A7R2 and the 5D SR. And uh, just see how those, I want to see those images just uh, head, head by to side. head. Yeah. So anyway, other things that are going on in the world. Talking about large uh, 4K, I mean, Canon has developed an 8K recording equipment, 120 megapixel. They're talking about putting that into a DSLR. I don't know if people are, are doing this because they're trying to follow Red, who was the engineer of the digital cinema camera, or what, but I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, because like, because theaters don't even project in 8K. Yeah, well, this is one of those things, but you know what, they said that about 4K. But they did. Who ever use 4K? When, well, when Sony 4K theaters came out, people went, "Whoa, this is cool," you know. But I just don't see people doing that for 8K, you know. Yeah. Like when, like 4K, it was like this cool thing that maybe someday we could achieve, you know. Maybe we don't need it, but we could achieve it. Yeah. With 8K, I'm going. I don't. We don't. I don't want to achieve this. Like, <laughs> let our let our like hard drive speeds increase. Let our SSD stuff increase. Let our computer processors speed up before we. That's the problem. Move you, to this you new always, format. It's, it's just like we're not ready for it. The media drives the the computers. You know, you have so much information. You now need faster computers. More. To, okay, so this this gets us into another conversation here that we're going yeah. to introduce right now. Yeah. And it's brand new. The Ninja Assassin came on the market September first. Wow. We got Look one that we did a lesson with uh, prior to September first. We posted that on the, our YouTube channel. So if you want to check that out, but. What was really fabulous about this thing, there's a couple of things. Yeah. One is, it is just, it's very lightweight. Ooh. For a seven inch monitor, it's fabulous. How's the monitor? Oh, the monitor is beautiful. Yeah? Uh, it's 1080p, it's a, wow. it's a great monitor. I was really pleased. We've used it now a couple of times. Uh, also, is it's $1,200. $1,295. $1,300. $1, yeah. So there you have it. Yeah, 4K though. I mean, now 4K. all those A7S and GH4 and yep. uh, all those users, this great, great accessory. Because not only, like you said, not only is it a 4K recorder, but if you want to use it as a monitor too, then it's a beautiful, fantastic beautiful monitor, monitor as well. So. so we shot with it on a project we shot last week and did one of the sections on it. And it was just nice because we shot everything 4K, single camera, Yeah. and then we're, we're punching in for the second camera. Yeah. So we're doing everything in 1080p. How'd that look? And it looks great. Yeah. It looks fabulous. Also, if you're shooting, like we shot some, uh, these people are doing a heating air conditioning kind of items. Yeah. On that locked off piece, you can you can scan it now. You can let the camera oh, wow. roll across, across it because it's 4K. So yeah. you can go into a quarter of the frame hmm. and it really little, gives it a little bit of move. A little movement. A little bit of movement. And uh, it's just, you know, is it ideal? You know, it's fascinating to me. Anyone who shoots with two cameras and two camera setups largely going to go, well, it's not as cool or as ideal, but I think it will become more and more the way it's you do things. It's a tool. 
Yeah, it's really simple to use. The, well, the reason I don't like the reason I don't like cropping in is is not because of the pixels. The pixels are there. It's for me. It's there's two things. First is the chromatic aberration on your lens, right? So when you start to to zoom in two or four times on a lens, then your glass isn't really built for it. You're going to start to blur the edges, and you're going to get chromatic aberration. And your color is going to be a little funky. Number two is the film. Did grain. we have any of that problem? Really? Not really? Great. Okay, no. great. No. And the, the second for me is is there's a grain, whether it's a digital grain or your film grain, yeah. and when you when you zoom in four times, that's a very unnatural, unartificial grain that you start to look at. And, and the way it kind of dances across the sensor. So if you have any kind of dark spots or drama at all, avoid it because you're going to start to see that, that uh, grain. Well, there you have it. All right, so what else is going on? Um, uh, Rokinon. Everybody loves those little Rokinon lenses, right? They're mm -hmm. like 500 bucks for, for cinema D-click lenses, but they're kind of more DSLR style, right? Mm -hmm. They're smaller. Uh, they're coming out with a set of cinema lenses, so they have bigger housings, larger hmm. throws. The problem is, I think they've they've not priced them very well. Uh -oh. They're twenty five hundred bucks a lens. Whoa! And and I'm going. All of a sudden now you're in a different category. Look, dude, it's the same glass as your five hundred dollar lens. It's the no. same glass. Yeah. So why would you buy it? I mean, what's the advantage? Because because people spend buco bucks on cinema lenses, right? Yeah, but what? Like the but Zeiss. What does it give you? It gives you larger throw, so you can get your you can do Let's your follow that, focus yeah. a little bit more precisely, and 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 it has you know you have the exact same. It's probably like a ninety five millimeter front uh, element, so that your your um all your your map box and your filters everything just fits right. So you don't have to you don't have to spend a lot of time re sizing everything or changing your filters. But the thing is, I mean like the Zeiss Zeiss CP2s, they're like four grand, forty five hundred dollars a lens. It's the exact same glass as the Z E series, you know, for your DSLRs. But you know, and the price difference is huge. It's two, three times more expensive. Um, four times more expensive. You know, so it's like it just depends. But I so that's that's this thing that's always existed. But I feel like with this kind of a lens, you can't price yourself that much out of the market because the, the thing, the reason, the only reason people like these lenses is because they're affordable. Absolutely. That's the only reason. You don't buy them because they compete with Zeiss. No, you buy them because they're super cheap. Yeah, that's absolutely, yeah, I don't get it. So, I don't know. I don't know, what the, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if they're going to be any good. They had a little test on, online and I was going, well, looks about the same as their other lenses, you know? It's like, it's not going to look any different. But it's a whole lot more. A whole lot more, yeah. So here's something from Red Dot Camera. They've created an app that makes your phone into a Leica camera, or at least a Leica type experience with a camera. A Leica experience, I think, is probably <laughs> before you get your head not chopped gonna, off. Yeah, <laughs> you're not going to create a Leica camera on your phone. Good news, iPhone users. Your iPhone is now a Leica it's a camera. Leica. <laughs> your value of your phone just went way yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of cool, though. They've they've got an app that has all the different Leica settings. It's two ninety nine, two dollars and ninety nine cents. Yeah, two dollars and ninety nine cents. Yeah. Hey, I I will absolutely buy it just because it'll yeah. be fun to play with. You know, yeah. and the, it says it's got a focusing ring, so you can focus. It's got, you know, of course, in a, a true Leica fashion, it doesn't have a ton of of controls. Bells but it whistles. Has, yeah, it's really meant to be quick and street photography kind of uh, thing. Sounds so fun. I think it'll be fun to play with. So red dot camera. This will be the Very only. Cool. Leica-esque thing I can afford. Yeah, that's right. Will afford. <laughs> Will afford. Yeah. All right. So what else we got? Well, let's see. This this Kodak 360-degree camera, which I don't really understand. Who? I, who? Kodak. Co who? Co Co Kodak. Kodak? Yeah. Co -DAC. I haven't DAK? heard of them in years Kodak? and years. <laughs> who was, when they, uh, chapter 11? I didn't they? Yeah. Uh, well, there you have it. They got, they got, Kodak. they, they made a deal. 11. So, there you go. <laughs> I remember when Kodak was like traveling to see the Great Oz. If you traveled to Rochester, New York, you could go see the Great Oz. At, uh, That's so funny. And the smoke and the whistles. And if you're really lucky, they would let you in. Yeah. <laughs> the Great Oz. <laughs> the Great Oz. So anyway, now they have a 360 degree camera. Cool. Well, a little late. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Neato. <laughs> I'm not sure what this is for. It's got a, it's surveillance. It's 360 degrees. What do you? I mean, can you hold it and not see yourself? I don't. So that's the 360 degree thing. I don't understand. Because Put it on your helmet. It's like a GoPro. 
Is that what it is? Is it has that what to they're, be. they're gunning for? Sure, it has to be. I mean, what else are you going to do with it? And other yeah. than surveillance. Yeah. You put it on your helmet and you see the whole world, you know? Camera offers 10 Maybe you'd see those. the person's nose on their helmet, you know? You, a suction mount uh, with remote control and a yeah. waterproof housing. Oh, we're, we're blowing this off. This is going to probably become the coolest thing ever, and we will have been the ones who didn't understand it whatsoever. We'll be the, the formerly known Great and Powerful Oz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great that, will, that will be We're us more like the monkeys. We're yeah, the monkeys. <laughs> flying that around, is true. making a lot of noise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't even know what we're flying for. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have no direction. We're just flying around. It's really fun. I got these wings and. Okay, no. I have something else. Okay, we've talked about it here. All right. This just came out. Wow. I just got it in oh, the mail yesterday. The B six. The B six. No uh, kidding. Dialyte. Are these in stores yet? Do you guys have the B6? The Baja, yeah. Baja, Baja B6? B6 from Dynalite? Not yet. We do. <laughs> Ken, you Need are you to so be more sarcastic special. on camera, Ken. I love it. <laughs> so here we go. Baja B6. It's in the same housing as the B4. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Jam packed. No, that looks longer to me. <laughs> That's definitely longer. That's and it's longer. definitely heavier. Yeah. Definitely heavier. So they've changed the housing just a little bit. All right, the B6, finally. So talk to me about it. Well, the nice thing about it, it is, it is 600 watt seconds. Okay. So you, the power, and that is uh. significant. I mean, people may say, well, no, that's really significant. You've yeah. gone from 400 watt seconds to 600 watt seconds. I've always felt like in this range, when you get 600, it's really a, a sweet spot for having enough power. To compete, like to, 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 to work with the sun. If okay, you're gonna yeah. overpower the sun, it just is much easier to do with this. Mm. It has all the things that the B4 had with regards to high-speed sync and um, battery portable. It's all that. So there's the Baja B6. A couple things about it. It has the same 11 volt uh, lithium battery that the uh, B4 has. So you're not gonna get as many flashes on full power. Obviously, you're yeah. gonna get less flashes on full power. It's a little heavier. Uh, but my mind for the power, I'll take it. I'll take the weight anytime because it just gives you more power, which I think is really valuable when you're in the sun in a sun situation. Yeah. This is nice too. It has a modeling light that turns off. And on. Turn it all the way off. There we go. And it's off. <laughs> now the modeling light's still pretty weak, but uh, that's never been the uh, strong part of the point of these things at all. But. Cool. What a cool so piece with of gear. A, for me, if I've got this as a, if I've got two or three B4s and a B6, then I'll probably use that B6 as a rim Keep, light. Oh, rim light. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Just want to kick a little extra power in the rim light, and then I can use the B4 for my softer light up front. Yeah. As you back it up a little bit more. Yep. Yeah. So it gets it away, and it just makes it really nice to use it in that way. So, but great, nice. great piece of equipment. Uh, you know, battery portable is thing right now. It is absolutely the thing, and especially monoblocks. So it's worth looking at. I don't think we know. We're not positive when this is available. Here at Sammy's, it's not in their system yet, but I know it's absolutely, it's going to be here any day. Cool. It has to be. I mean, Peter at Dynalite's been talking about it, and uh, he sent one, which means there's one, this one. <laughs> if you'd like to buy it, give us a call. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> it's not for sale. All right. That's fun. Cool. There you go. Panasonic keeps putting along. They've got this new DVX200 that's coming out. It's their 4K version. And I gotta mention it only because the DVX100 was like the th back, you know, 15 years ago. That was like the thing that I was first looking at when I was like this film enthusiast, you know, I was just wanting to get into it. And it was just like this like camera that was just way out there. It was like this $3,000, but it was the first film or first uh, mini DV camera that did 24p. And so it was like starting to get more into the cinema thing. And so I really wanted one. So I, I mentioned that this, this DVX200 that's coming out is, is 4K because it's it should be kind of interesting. That's cool. You know, and it's like it's more of that traditional. It's the exact same form factor practically. Yeah. And it's about 4,200 bucks. Um, but the images look nice. They look nice. It's a smaller sensor if you're into that kind of thing. Keep things in focus. So well, there you have it. That's coming out. Very good. Yeah, that was uneventful. It um, was. It sure was. <laughs> that's coming out. There's a <laughs> thing. Coming out. There's and a it's thing. coming out. From Panasonic, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so news and reviews. Did you see the lady that tripped the uh, refugee on the? Uh... I did. <laughs> what do you think about it? I mean, I, without, I without think... knowing the politics of where they are, it's a yeah. I have no idea yeah. what's going on. 
I think she was just trying to get a nice shot. I think she tripped him because you see her camera go immediately onto the guy who falls on the ground. Yeah. I think she's just trying to get a shot. Oh man, what a terrible person! <laughs> she's kicking jeans. Do you think in the? Do you think in the? <laughs> do you think in the scheme of photojournalism and photography that people don't do really despicable things to get a shot? It's an interesting concept. People will do you know, despicable things to get a shot. Well, there's a, a movie that you won't see called Nightcrawler with Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. That just came out last year that's all about that. Oh, really? Yeah, he like find, he, he's like gets this like super souped up car. He's a news, he decides to be a news guy. And he like, you know, will race the police to get there. And then he gets to the scene, he'll like move a body <laughs> and dress things out. <laughs> and then he'll like go and like push a car. You know, it's like he'll like do all these things if there's no one around and like then he'll get the shot and it's like more dramatic. But it's really creepy and an amazing performance. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, I think that, I mean, there probably would be people like that. And oh, back get, to the day of Ouija, they used to do the four by five sheet film on a speed graphic. You yeah. know, he was trying to be there before the police, trying wow. to get shots of of crimes going down, dead bodies. You know, yeah. all those things. You know, back in that day, they thought that was despicable. Yeah, they thought you know this guy is out there taking pictures of dead bodies. Wow. And they thought that was just on the edge. Now it's like oh, it's another dead body. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't know though. Do. We kind of, I feel like we kind of did like a little bit of a. Now we're going back the other way. Because you don't really see dead bodies unless they blur their faces or yeah. bodies and stuff on TV, which yeah. is nice. That's nice. Yeah. Well, there's our news reviews for the month of uh, September. Hopefully things will be a little more exciting in October, and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, So now it's time to answer some of your comments. We love your comments, so keep them coming. So in our little mailbox here, let's see what we got. We have a few comments that came in our Flamingo mailbox. Nicholas Streak. Love that name, Nicholas. You would have been really a hit in the 70s. <laughs> so, <laughs> great show. I agree about full frame. When I went uh, from the D7100 to the D800, I could see a big difference in image quality. I wish I went full frame from the beginning, but it was a good learning experience. Keep the videos coming. Totally. Absolutely. I remember too, man, when I went from my, from my T2i from, to 5D Mark II. Oh my. It was just like... The whole world opens up. The whole world, absolutely. And I had a 17 to, to 35, 2.8 L-series lens. And it was just like, that 17, I couldn't take enough pictures at 17 millimeters. <laughs> it's just like, the so color, fun. the fisheye. Ah! It blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you know how much I love full frame cameras. Yeah. Just so, shout it anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. PD said, <laughs> it's the name PD. I said, good show. PD, where can are we, you a rapper? Where can we get t-shirts? Good oh, question. Good t-shirts question. T-shirts are in works. In the works. They are in the works. <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. In the worst way. I was so way. insulted about my t-shirt. Were you really I insulted? Not, uh, I can't tell because you keep you do this thing where like I think you're joking, but I'm not too sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not too sure they'll sell <laughs> <Yeah>. right now. <laughs> That's the problem. No, they will. They'll sell. If you think yeah. the t-shirts will sell, give us a shout out. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll produce them. I mean, they're done. I just need to put them up. So... <laughs> <laughs> I All have right. some other ideas too. Okay, so moving along. C100 Mark I or the Ursa Mini for music videos. Help! Okay. This is coming from Blast the Beat Blast TV. Blast the Beat TV. All right, music videos, It's you're going to want slow motion. So it would either be the Mark II for the C100 or the Ursa Mini. So you're looking at about $5,500 starting point uh, for both. And and I, you know, that's completely up to you. I think the Cirsa Mini, once it finally comes out. Yeah, but right now it's not out yet. So right. it's kind of like you're making comparison with something we don't even know we don't, for sure. We don't know. In theory, the Ursa Mini is going to be really a very phenomenal camera. In theory, 15 In theory. stops dynamic oh, range, 4.6 me uh, megapixel sensor. Megapixel? Do you know you four, yeah. point, 4.6K. There you go. You yeah. know you can get 15 stops out of your uh, A7S. No, you can't. You can. No, you can't. You can. How? I'm telling you. There's a, a picture profile that'll give you uh, 15 stop, 14 stops of uh, dynamic range. But the lowest ISO you can shoot at 3200. 3, right, the, the S-Log. I thought it was 12 stops. No, I, well, the thing I read said 14. That's impressive. But it's 3200. You have to put like 15 yeah. NDs on front of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, yeah. we digress. Yes, we do. So I don't know. The, you know it, it, I love the C100 Mark I. Wait for the Ursa Mini and see what it does. See what man. it does. I, I, I would wait. Yeah. Just check Because I think out. it's supposed to do like 96 frames a second. So when you're doing music videos, that's, that's like everybody. Every band, you shoot, you shoot like a slow motion thing, and you'll be like, hey, and you'll show them playback, and they all go, 
oh, they all lose their minds. It's the coolest thing they've ever seen. Because they're like into music. That's their thing. That's their passion. And they can do guitar riffs like you've never seen. But then you show them a clip of slow motion with like some bokeh and they just, their heads explode. <laughs> so yeah, slow motion. All right, so Silurian so, said, DSLR dead for filmmaking? What type of video camera is taking over? What price point are we talking about? You know, we said the last time that DSLR was dead. On its way out. I think we were mistaken in that thought. Well, I think I'll what we're saying why. is production. You're not seeing as much production. They're starting to separate a little bit again. because I, I don't know. With the Sony A7 II, A7R A7 Mark, II. Mark, Mark II, you have all of a sudden now everyone's going, oh, 4K and that sensor stabilization. Sony's the exception, though. Sony, Sony's doing Sony's like a Sony's the exception, S, but it be, like, it's now becoming the rule. Everyone's yeah. going to have to get on that boat. I yeah. don't think it's over. I think we mistook, misspoke. Possibly. It depends on the, but it is interesting how the DSLRs and these kind of lower end production cameras like the Ursa Mini are getting closer in price to one another. Which yeah. is, but again, if you want to do stills and video, then you have to go with something like the new, the new Sony. Yeah, the A7R2. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, price price wise, I mean, you can buy a C100 Mark I new for $3,000 still. Like, that's crazy. The, the uh, FS700 from Sony just uh, lowered its price to $4,000 from 500. So now if you want super slow motion and 4K, and, I mean, so now it's like there are these options here and the prices are coming a lot closer together. Yeah. So it's interesting. So it's not dead, yep. but it's certainly in the midst of being reshaped. There's no doubt about that. Yep. And uh, where that's going to end up, who knows? Okay, Mark uh, Kuhn said, JP, I'd like to know more about shooting tethered on location. I've tried the traditional tethered to a laptop and hated it. It was cumbersome and distracting. Just started testing using the iFi card to, te uh, to tether to my iPhone. Shows some promise, thoughts, or suggestions. You know, iFi is great, but you got to have only SD cards. You can't do it with the compact flash, right. which is a bit of a... And then uh, every SD card has to have iFi. Yep. Well, you ha yeah, you have to use their cards to right. have the Wi-Fi in the card. You know, I've tethered a million cameras. I've tethered, tethered through everything from uh, Photoshop, not Photoshop. I've tethered through everything using Bridge to Lightroom, US, uh, 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 Canon utilities, US Canon utility. utilities, uh, definitely Lightroom. The only thing out there I think is really kind of interesting is Cam Ranger. It's a little more effective. It's going to be a little more easy to use, but in the end, you're still tethered, which means you've got a cable from your camera. I don't think there's a great Wi-Fi solution out there. I'm no. not aware of any. There are some great tools out there where you can get your laptop on a C-stand so you can have it very close by and the tethering's a lot easier. You can be right there, but in the end, you're just tethered and it's a little bit cumbersome. Yeah. So, Jordan Garcia said, what do you think would be better for video, the new Sigma 24 to 35 or the Tamron 24 to 70? I have a Canon 60D and I'm looking for a good mid-range zoom lens and have a super wide um, and a 50 millimeter, but nothing in between or longer. Uh, you know, I, I think, because you've got your super wide and a 50 millimeter, probably a low aperture, maybe somewhere around a 1.4 or a 1.8, um, a 24 to 70 is, you're gonna wanna get into that longer focal length at this point. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, with what he's already got, I wouldn't stack another, you know, 24, 35 on that. It's like you're it's on the wide. bottom. Yeah. yeah, you're on the so, bottom. And a crop sensor, you know, you're looking at about a 35 to 50, which is very normal, but um, at 70 millimeters on a crop sensor, you're gonna start to get some really beautiful portraiture. Right. Yeah, portraitry kind of style stuff, or just kind of close up. Some it's gonna be one hundred and ten or somewhere in there. It's gonna be over one hundred. Yeah, one hundred so, millimeters. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do the twenty four seventy. It just otherwise you're all in wide. So, Scully nineteen sixty nine said, "Great info on lighting. This is about the uh, industrial portraits at the SKB factory that we shot. Um, great info on lighting. I like the way you throw uh, in gels here and there. A simple but very effective touch." You know, that has not gotten as much exposure as I thought it would, but yeah. there's just really solid lighting instruction in that, uh, that tutorial. So check it out. It's uh, Industrial Portraits. We were shooting out at the SKB uh, factory. Yeah. It's been a great relationship as we've got to know SKB. They're now our sponsor. It's just been a great connection. So. They're really nice guys. They really are. Alberta Cabrera. <laughs> Wow, this really isn't realistic. Most manufacturing plants or companies will not give you that much time to set up all those lights or have such a complicated setup. Usually you are on the go, 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 and only have a few minutes to set up and shoot. The video is outstanding. I just don't think it's true representation of shooting on location in a manufacturing plant. I'm telling you, it absolutely is because I've done it time and time again. 
The reality is, though, you've got to prepare the people before you go for what's going to happen. Yeah. I need X amount of time. I need 30 minutes. I'm going to have to set some lights up in the background when the factory's working. You just you get it as close as you can, and you fly and you shoot it. I don't know how long we were on that setup, but we were there for we were there for quite hours, a while. They were very hours. generous with us with here's, time. Here's what I have to say: it is realistic because we did it. We did it. You know what I mean? At and, a at a factory that's working. Right, and and they, we didn't shut down production. We didn't even. I mean, I think for that one section we shut down. We slowed that one before. section down. But I yeah, I mean, the bottom line is you just have to ask for it. You have to ask for it, and SKB when they got the images going, these are fabulous. I mean, right. it was worth it to them. The, you have to build, I just spit all over the camera, you have to build value in the image. And when you build that value, they're willing to, to close things off, they're willing to stop things for you. So if you build value in the image, say, this is going to be great images in the end, then they'll, they'll do it for you. Yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul Christian said, hi, I use a Pentax K50 crop sensor, and I've noticed I'm using shutter speeds always uh, at or faster than one two hundredth of a second. I recently bought myself a Pentax K1000, it's a film camera, and on that I, I can't and don't use a uh, 1 to 200 shutter speed. Uh, should I break myself from this routine? I haven't developed any of my pictures from the K1000 yet. Thank you. I'm trying to, I think there's something in this equation that uh, we've got to connect the dots here. First off, just because you're on a Pentax K50 does, and it's a crop sensor doesn't have any relationship to your shutter speed. It's your lighting situation, it's your ISO maybe, you may have your ISO at you know, as low as it'll go, or as high as, you know, yeah. high, and so now yeah. you're having to use a fast shutter. Yeah, sure. So there's something going on there that you need to connect the dots on. So give us a little more information, but the reality is if you set your ISO correctly, you should be able to get your shutter speed down to where you want. Obviously, you can't hand hold it below a 60th. Even a 60th is pretty shaky sometimes, but... Yeah. Yes, break yourself from that routine. Break it. Break it now. Yeah. Break you it should, down. You should be able to... I mean, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be a routine. No, there shouldn't. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's what's going to work yeah. for what you're shooting. Yeah. So if you're going to have to get yourself into a mode of thinking about shutter as a creative tool, not necessarily as just a way to get an exposure. Yeah. And that, that'll make a huge difference. Great. Okay. Okay. Can Darryl? I do the next one? Yeah. From Daryl Morgan. Actually, I have, a con I have an uncle named Daryl. Not Morgan. Oh, man. But so close. close. Okay. Uh, what do you believe is the best flash for the Canon 7D using the model used for model weddings and portraits? Also, love your videos and teaching. Really admire you. Thank you so much, Daryl. You know, this is one of those questions. Like, it just depends on what you want to do. Here's my problem with flashes: is most people get into it with a speed light, you know, which is a compact, easy light to carry around with you, but they're expensive for the watt seconds you get. But they are an easy light to learn with. You know, you put it on your camera, it immediately talks to your camera, you can get an exposure, they're easy to use. So if you're just starting out, that's probably a good place to start. What about those young Nuo, Nuo things on Amazon? Like those you know, those Chinese, are, I bought one of those, Chinese like $50, yeah. you know? You know, those things work. If you yeah, want to use one of those, maybe that's the introduction. Buy one yeah. of those for $50. Yeah, the colors are consistent. It. No, it's, it's not. It's just like, I mean, it's all over the place. It's all over but, the place. But at least you'll get a, a brighter image. You know, you can play with that, and yeah. then you can step up. So. If you're doing weddings and you're really serious about weddings, then you've got to step into something. You can use the speed lights. It absolutely does work. I think the battery capabilities are a little slow and you've got to keep putting batteries in them. It's a little tough to do a wedding. So like the, the Pro Photo series, the B2 or the something like that's a little more wedding friendly, but very expensive platform. But yeah. if you are just doing models and portrait kinds of things, I think the Baja B4s are an incredible entry point right now because you yeah. get a portable battery monoblock. Uh, monoblock that you can set up on a stand, you can use it and it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, there are the Einstein and the several of those other platforms there, uh, White Lightnings. There's some great monoblocks out there that you can get that give you a whole lot more power uh, for actually the same dollar value as uh, speed lights. So. Yeah. It's from Alex Sarna. <laughs> Hi JP. Uh, great stuff on the Slender Lens. Uh, this video on corporate photos was excellent. This is what I specialize in, and if you guys are ever in Ottawa or Montreal, Canada, please be in touch as I would love to come and assist. See what uh, goes on behind the scenes. Attaches a sample of my recent corporate headshots for local clients. Your thoughts on my work is very much appreciated. Thanks in advance. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. What's your first thought when you look at them? Contrast. There's an contrast. Uh, see, I, and I, I like the, see this first one, I like the background. I think it's kind of cool. You got some out of focus elements and, mm -hmm. and little points of light there, so you get your nice bokeh. Um, but for me, I'm not seeing any contrast in her face. There's no shape, and uh, and that's something you know because it's because we shoot 2D 
images, you, you want to create just a little bit of contrast there. You can. So you can start to see kind of the features of the person's face, and that's, and that's what I'm seeing there. Yeah. Well, I love, I think you're absolutely right. If you're in a situation where you've got so much natural light that it's, it's doing this to you, subtract some light. So yeah. bring a reflector, a black reflector, and slide it in there. Slide it underneath her, you know, to just Dude, take a little bit of light go, out there. Go down to Walmart and buy, I don't know if they have a Foam sure. core. Yeah, buy foam core, man. Yep. Just a, a four by four foam core and just rig it somehow. Just bring it in closer if you don't have a stand or anything. And that's, even that's going to start to subtract some of that light and give yeah. you a little bit more shape. I love the leading lines. You, you've taken that staircase back there and you've at least let those lines lead right into her and mm -hmm. it kind of envelops her. I think that's really pretty. Mm -hmm. I think it's been done very nicely. Composition's nice. Yep. Yeah, composition's very, composition's very nice. Our man, it, same issue, a little bit flat. You can see you've got two color sources going there. You have a window from the left and a lamp from the right. Yep. So you might want to neutralize one of those to just kind of help it out and subtract some light. You've got pretty work. You've got great work. So personally, I'd cut the lamp entirely, and I think you'd have a great image. What I what I would do, honestly, with this hey, one. Hey, did you hear that? Was that I Ken? I think Ken's probably here for his next segment. Oh, perfect. What does Ken want to talk about? So let's wrap it up here really quick. With yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would get a white foam core and bring it on the same side as the window. Just bring that catch light in the eyes around just a little bit more, but then turn the lamp off. That's what I would perfect. do. Yeah. Or add an LED or a strobe with a small box. We've yeah, done that a that lot. Same si same got on side. his face, come to this side, opens yeah. up his face, lit. Check out um, shooting industrial, no, what was the? Uh, corporate. Corporate portraits. We corporate showed portraits. how to do that in yeah. the video we did. And then bring in a fill card. So, yeah. Excellent, Alex. Thank you for sharing. And you know what? I am committing to you. I will be in Montreal in 2016. Uh, my wife and I have wanted to come there for a long time. We'll come and do a slam lens shoot. We'll have you uh, help us and we'll have a great time. So stay in touch great. with us. Coming to Montreal, 2016. Well, thanks, you guys, for these comments. We appreciate them, and we, we take the time to answer them. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to, to post and on the videos, and, and we'll get to them as, as quickly as we can. Please, keep them coming. Doo -doo! Giveaways are back here on the Slanted Lands. We're giving away this 150 to 600 millimeter lens. Well, not this one, a new one from Tamron. So go to theslantedlands.com, check it out. So here we are with what does Ken want to talk about? And it looks kind of scary to me, actually. Sensor that... cleaning, come on. Oh, it's all what it's about, right? Sensor cleaning, don't, okay. Don't you, don't you use Windex when you're cleaning no, your can, sensor? No, do, do tell. Wait, no, no, no. I mean, seriously. You know, I always, always told, what, you put it on bulb for exposure, you're locking open the thing, you're actually spraying in there. <laughs> He's spraying Windex. This is literally, sensor. literally <laughs> take Q-tips. <laughs> Yeah, and then take, you know... Hide the cameras. What you do? This, the can't, there's what? stuff flipping all over the place. That's not how you clean a sensor? <laughs> you got... Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, we do need to also have paper towels to actually clean out the extra lubricant, you know... That's a digital stuff. sensor in there, Ken. Yeah, it is. It used to be. <laughs> well, I mean... It used to be a digital sensor before he sprayed really? Windex in there. Oh, I'm sorry, canned air. That will dry it out, right? Oh, no. With uh, Windex, no? he's going to okay. be... Well, I got the Brillo pad, isn't that what you need to, you well, know, clean to it up too? I think to kind of rough it up. Yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> that gets off the major spots. stuff. You gotta it gets get the dust greater, oh, It gives you greater dynamic range. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that, no, yeah, of course not. If you use any of this crap Wait, on your camera, this? I'm sorry to say. That's sandpaper, literally. Okay. What would you use sandpaper? So how well, about... I usually do that on the back. <laughs> You know, just a oh, up that. Yeah, just, oh, just, just to fix the string up a little bit. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's clean that <laughs> off. Buff it out a yeah. little bit. Oh my! So I mean, Look no, you don't. You don't do any of this stuff with it. And unfortunately, I know people use like canned, canned air, on, air the on the sensor. <laughs> yeah, now it has Lysol in there. Well, now it's got a fresh scent though. You're killing the yeah. germs and the bacteria, right? Isn't nice. that part that? Nice. No, everybody gets dust on their sensors, and you know what? So how do you clean? Don't it? use any of this stuff. <laughs> so canned air? Okay. No, no please, not, not even canned air. All right. So if you've got dust on the sensor, and this is inevitable, okay? Anybody is going to get dust on their sensor. We know that. Okay. How will you tell if you have dust on your sensor? Oh, you know what? That's a great question. Easiest way, I suggest shooting like a blue sky. At an f22. At <laughs> roughly f22, f f16. Yeah. So you want to close down the aperture on the lens. You want to shoot a blue sky so that when you look at the image, you can see the dark specks. Yep. And that's what's going to be crop up all in dark. there. Yep. Exactly. So, but remember, when you're looking at an image, everything is inverted. So if it seems to be on the top of the image, it's actually on it's the, the bottom, bottom of the sensor. Of the sensor. So you, know, you want to maybe focus on those areas then that you see the dust in. Mm. So first things first, 
a lot of the cameras nowadays have a dust removal built into the cameras. Yep. So it Every vibrates time you turn the, the sensor mic three off. It says vibrate. yeah, vibrating yeah. and cleaning the sensor. Yep. Well, that's kind of the first one that's like our preliminary of everything, and hopefully that'll keep it normally clean. But unfortunately, that's not going to keep it 100% clean. So the next thing I do is I suggest getting a and small spaceship from the 1960s. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from a previous episode. So these are the what they basically call rocket airs. Uh, there Jonas you have it. makes this. Um, I don't <laughs> recommend a really tiny one because the tinier ones don't have a force of air that you can push out with. So you really want to go for the larger styles. So like this one is a seven inch. This one's also seven inch. So they have a nice force of air. But when you're cleaning it, point the camera down. So it has a place so to you go. Turn so the... it full, yeah, so you turn the camera upside down so the lens would be normally pointed down. Uh -huh. with, uh, okay, so how do we expose the sensor? Back to that. So, so exposing the sensor. A lot of the cameras will have a sensor cleaning mode. So you actually have to go into the menu and basically oh, go into there. And the sensor cleaning mode, it actually locks the sensor, well, basically locks the mirror up and the shutter open and doesn't charge the sensor. You gotta oh. remember, sensors are a magnet to dust. So when you're constantly taking your lenses off and on, if you're in a dusty environment, all you're doing is opening up the cavity of the body and getting dust, little particulates in there. Mm -hmm. And when you take that picture, that dust gets sucked right like a vacuum right against that sensor. Why? Well, it's actually a piece of glass. The, the glass is actually getting um, basically charged. charged. It's getting charged oh, and that electricity glass draws the dust. Interesting. So, so when you put it in sensor cleaning mode, it, it turns disables it off. That, it disables the charge of the sensor itself, which is going to disable the charge to the actual glass. Mm, perfect. So that when you clean it, or at least in this first instance, using a blower brush or so, or blower without bristles. Okay. Don't use bristles. Those are for the lenses, not for yep. the body, or not for the sensors. And that will help swirl the air around in the inside and hopefully pull that dust right off of that piece of glass. <laughs> so let's do one really quick. Let's do that. That can work. So yes. Um, however, we already have this thing soaked wet with Windex. Just as a demonstration. But I'm, this one didn't have it because this is a much earlier camera. But yes, you invert the camera and you basically start swirling that air around inside. You want to make sure you don't touch the sensor. And you don't want to touch the sensor because that can do more damage if you tap oh. it or something oh, like yeah. that. That's, yeah, yeah it would be not you know, good. It makes me cringe, actually. It does. No. It does. <laughs> so yeah, there's a mode in the five There is a mode. Yes. I've seen it, yeah. Oh, one yes. sensor cleans. So, so, so that will save you a lot of time because when you're cleaning that sensor, what's happening? Is the dust, dust is coming is right back off and then right back on. Interesting. So you're just moving it around in the camera at that point. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not good. So what's the no. next step if you don't use so, that so if there? Okay, then I do another test to make sure that it's actually, if, if I've cleaned it, so if it's actually gotten clean, if it's still showing up that dust, well then I gotta go and if I gotta step it up a little bit. Okay. And I gotta step it up with the sensor swabs, which are gonna be something like this. Grab the other one too, please. Oh, this just scares me. You're actually gonna touch the sensor with something. Well, I don't why know. should that scare you? Because it just scares me. Okay, you know what? That's a perfectly valid point. Touching the sensor, you're actually not touching the sensor. You're touching a piece of glass in front, front of the, of the sensor. sensor. But that piece of glass is still a bit fragile. So what you do have to be careful with is when you are using it, you do want to use uh, actually a solution. And use a solution that was designed for basically a sensor. So don't use optical cleaning fluid again, like a Windex or something like that. <laughs> That's going to be very bad news. And don't use like ROR, which would be residual oil remover. Those are for lenses. Um, even though it is technically an optic, yeah, but it's, um, not it's not the same type of optic. It doesn't have it doesn't, the coatings on it. Exactly. <laughs> so it has an IR filter, basically, or an IR block, which actually can be damaged. So you do want to use something that's like this. Uh, this is pretty much almost straight alcohol to a point. Clips? Yeah. Um, it evaporates very quickly. Mm -hmm. So when you put it, a solution on here, don't saturate it. You want to use a let's, few let's drops. Let's do it. Show us how to do um, it. I don't have one of these open. How much are they? 40 bucks. 40 bucks. 40 with, bucks? Why with, is it so expensive? Because they're hermetically sealed, each one of those, so they're completely clean of any free of debris, etc. So we can do three so of them. So you yeah, actually you get about 12 in there. Wings, they give me one of those things. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
You can't use them. And those are free. Okay, okay. here, you've got your Windex. Go Perfect. ahead. I mean, you, oh, I'm sorry, here, your paper towels, because they have those <laughs> at the table, too. But what I mean is, you can't say that something's $40 just because they're individually wrapped. Okay, how much time and effort does it take to get out dust on every single image that you just took? A long time. A long it's very time. So your time is invaluable. Okay, so tell us how you do this. I'm going to get us back <laughs> to the point here. That's what your team. The uh, each one of these, like I said, is hermetically sealed, basically in its own little container. Oh, this is so, a much different deal here. Okay, oh, wow. so these are specifically yeah, with flies. Seen these before? Mm -hmm. uh, like tongue? <laughs> yes. So a tongue dispenser. <laughs> so on the sensor, Sorry. Speed this up, Dylan. <laughs> there's two, three. There's also a one, and that's all dependent upon the size of the sensor. So each of these will fit basically ah. perfectly in mm. on the sensor itself. So these are the wrong size for this. These are more of a full size camera. And so, do you use the liquid and then this? You use you the liquid, just a couple drops literally across the paddle itself. Okay. And then, in one direction, you want to pull it across, across the, sensor. the sensor. If you pull it across the sensor, it's like a squeegee feel, you know, think of it that way. I then usually do 180 degrees and go the opposite direction with the same thing. No, both directions. So, I'm going both directions with it. Now, again, you don't want to saturate this. Because if you do, that just leaves a lot more excess in the camera body, and that's not good too. You're trying to clean it. You're not trying to saturate the camera like we did earlier. Yeah, excellent. The other thing is be very careful not to do anything else inside the camera body but the piece of glass and the sensor. There's other things like oils and there's other like um, lubricants in there yeah. that you don't want to pull onto the sensor. Yeah. So, um, so you want to get this right on the sensor, right on the one sensor, way, one direction, back. then back the other yeah. direction. A couple of drops of solution. Now, does the solution does come help? with this or no? Um, well, this stuff, no, it doesn't come with it. Okay, but so a single bottle a will last you a long time as long as you keep yeah. it capped. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is something that's out on the market too. This is made by LensPen. It's a sensor clear loop kit. So instead of having to constantly take pictures and take a look at the picture and evaluate the picture, I can actually look at the sensor through a loop. So it goes over the whole camera, I'm able to evaluate and look at the physical sensor plane, and there's little lights on there so it helps light it up, and then I can evaluate and see, okay, where does it need to be cleaned, where does it not? So when sign. you pay fifty dollars to send your camera in to get the sensor clean, the guy pops the one of these open, about there's a several on there. Views. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you know why it costs around fifty dollars to get your yeah, sensor clean. Absolutely. I'm looking so, at this kit and I'm going, I, I'm I mean, at least fifty dollars the, invested. There's about maybe a hundred dollars worth. $120 worth of stuff here, which obviously you're going to be cleaning your sensor on a regular basis. You know, you do it maybe once every six months, once every three months. It depends upon how much you're shooting, how many times you're taking that lens off and on the camera. That makes a huge difference. So a lot of these things are really good practice. And like I said from the beginning, start it first with basically your, your basic blower brush, you know, without the bristles. Do that first, see how it is. Then you you know step up the game to a, a wet solution, uh, and you might need to do that two or three times. Wow, really? Mm -hmm. And that just gets everything absolutely clean and spotless. Uh, one thing you cannot get out of, and this is where if you're in a really humid environment, which you know we don't have that real problem here, but condensation can happen on the sensor, and that is never going to come out with basically a blower yeah. brush. So you need to use alcohol. a wet solution, Some sort of, somehow yeah. sort of alcohol to get rid of that. So that helps immensely. When I shoot in humidity, we got the, the Alexa has a high humidity option. Oh, yeah, and it, it burns the sensor hotter, so it, it burns humidity. Burns all that humidity. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. The uh, last little bit, like there, so, this is like, uh, so if you don't want to get an a la carte everything, they do have small little kits. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, this is an Eclipse kit. This one. Uh, How many cleanings do you get? Um, this has got about, probably about maybe four or five of the okay. sensor swabs like itself. Bucks? But it so does also have the solution. Yes. Well, because it only has a couple of like these at the same five. time. It has a little tiny bottle oh, of solution. So it's basically to be able to throw in your bag and keep going on. So, so you're, you're going to get, you, here's basically one solid cleaning right there. Yeah. You may get two, depending upon if it's not too dirty. Oh, really? But you probably get one definite without mm. a problem. Mm. But you just need to buy more of the sensor swabs because the bottle of oh, solution yeah. is going to last you a lot longer. Okay, sure. so let me wrap this up here. So. Stage one. Stage one. 
is going to be a oh, blower brush. Blower brush, upside down, blow inside. Absolutely. Stage two Stage is, two a is swab, the wet solution. A little wet solution on a swab, right, left? Yep. And then I usually would just follow it up with another couple quick bursts of bursts. the air okay. just to make sure that I got all the dust out of and it. And if you really want to go all for it, you do the whole kit there that's got a loop so you can see if it's clean or not. Yeah, that's a lens on it. Blue sky. Yeah, that's great. Um, be careful. There are a lot of solutions out there. I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the dry brush technique, which yeah. is another one that they say. And that's where you electrically charge a basically dry brush with like a blower air or something like that. And then you drag it across the actual sensor. I'm not a big fan of that one. I, but a lot of people do swear by it. Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, the vacuum systems. Be very careful with a vacuum. Uh, <laughs> because all of a sudden, it's zip, it goes right onto the sensor itself, yeah, and then you can damage it if you're not terrible. like a very good with also, your hands. Also, there's a big smudge in every image you take, yeah. you know? Actually, it would be more like a broken mirror or a broken <laughs> sensor oh, at that man. point. Really um, I mean, okay, what's the worst thing that could ever happen? Obviously, you scratched or you damaged the camera by doing this. Um, so just you know, use a, you know, a lot of caution when you're doing this. And if you don't feel comfortable with it, that's why we have services out there for cleaning sensors. So, yeah. you know, bring the camera down. Uh, we do a pretty quick turnaround when it comes to it. And it's, you know, depending upon the size of sensor, it can be anywhere from 35 to $50 for the camera itself. In, in theory, is there anything different between a DSLR and a Red Epic? No. There's absolutely really no difference. Maybe the technique of as you take the camera apart, you have actually a little bit easier access to the sensor. Right, because you just take like, the PL off. Yeah, when you right, take the PL off. The camera's not even on, you don't even have to go into sensor PL. Precisely. You don't turn the camera on, don't plug it in, let it be disabled, let the charge not be in it. The higher the yeah. pixel count the camera, the worse you're going to have with dust. Oh yeah. Well, that makes sense. It does. Yeah, so absolutely. Absolutely. Much you, things are going to show up more. It's going to show up a lot more. Yeah. So you know, be aware that you know you get into these cameras, your maintenance is going to be a little bit higher too. Hmm. There you have it. Cool. Well, there you have it. What Ken wanted to talk about: clean sensors. I think this was great information. This was good. Very good information. So, get out there, clean your sensor. If you're not comfortable comfortable cleaning your sensor, then uh, send it in to get it clean. But it is something you should probably do at least on a. Well, it depends on how much you're shooting. Okay. It really it's all about it. And, and the depends other thing is sometimes, you, you know, well. don't clean it until you see a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay, for our next segment here, we are going to compare the Canon 5DSR to the Sony A7R2. A7R2. Why are we going to compare these two? Well, we have uh, full frame sensors on both of them. Two full frame sensors. Uh, one has 40 megapixels, one has 50 megapixels. And at that point, it's tomato or tomato, dude. 40, 50, I don't know, 40, 50. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, no, I, I, I mean, these are the two hot cameras that are on the market right now that, that I think people are either migrating to or migrating away from. And interesting. so uh, it'll be interesting to see what we think. I mean, we've kind of had some hands-on stuff for the last 15 minutes and <laughs> And immediately, here's what I'm. Here's my thought. First, first impression. First impression. Um, the 5 dsr If you're coming from a 5D Mark III or even a 5D Mark II, totally. Understand. You're just like, yep. You're gonna like, be intuitive. You're gonna love it. Your exposure triangles there. You know, you're, you change your white balance. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, I'm coming from an A7S. I don't have a 5D Mark III anymore. I have an A7S, which should be the exact same thing. No, no, and it's, it's not. It's not the exact same thing. I don't. I still don't know how to change my white balance. 15 minutes later. It's like, and I, you know what I mean? It's like, Don't worry about it. The camera will do it for you. Yeah, exactly. First, first thing, I mean, I really like that they've extended the photo button. Instead of like cramping my finger up here to take a photo right where this guy is, it's down here. It feels a lot more intuitive. Um, I don't like how my aperture wheel is down below this. Are you afraid you're going to bump it or something or what? I just can't find it. Oh, you can't find it. Is it too? Is it too in there? Too deep? Or it's something? really deep. Oh, it is kind of in there. Yeah, deep, isn't and it? it's kind of hard. You really have to. And then it's like on the 5D or the 5DSR. It's above it, and it's just this big honking wheel that you can rotate back and forth. Well, it so. is interesting when you hit record on this one. I mean, mm -hmm. when I hold it in my hand, yeah, I can take stills here, yeah, and I can hit record here. That is nice. This one's still got the record. You got to pull way Woo! over to the side, to the way side here, over there, which is a little obnoxious. And it's a tiny button that you don't even really. I mean, it's just kind of like hard to find. I never am sure if I've hit it or not. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, we gotta we gotta differentiate between we're used to this camera platform. Yeah, and kind of though. I mean, well, yes here, and no. Let me show you one thing on this. Yeah. I think is really interesting. When you have the preview set, like a two-second preview, when you take a picture, now when you look at it, you can look at it on the back screen. Yeah. But if you're in the mode where your eye is up to the finder, that two seconds 
is now in your view when you're trying to take a picture. So you, you're now you're moving on. That two yeah, seconds, you're uh, way I mean, past you're that. Something you happening quick, yeah. quick, and you're trying to shoot in the preview. So I just turned the preview off. Now what's driving me crazy is that when I take a picture, I have no preview. Yeah. I, there's nothing that comes up on the back. So if I want to look at it, I got to turn it on. Whereas so with the, the Mark III, I'm shooting, looking, shooting, looking, you know. And so what we need, Sony, and we desperately need it, is the option to turn off the viewfinder from the monitor on the, on the back. Maybe so, there is that option here. Maybe I, I, just I couldn't find it. It was either one or the other. So, so what I what I need is to be able to be taking pictures and have it immediately refresh, so that I'm not looking at a image that I shot two seconds ago because I'm yeah. way past that. I need to see real time what's going on, but then when I pull it away, I want to see the last picture that I took. Absolutely. Because that so. way you can be making adjustments to exposure, you can you got something to look at. You got something yeah. that's making sense. I need that. Yep, I agree. I think the black finish on it is interesting. Yeah, so it's, like it's it. more of a matte finish instead mm -hmm. of a kind of a gloss metal that the Sony A7S had. Um, one thing I will say that is amazing on the A7S R2, or A7R2. A7R2. Oh my gosh. A7R2. A7R2 is, we put this Metabones version 4 adapter on it, and these lenses are snapping to focus just almost as fast as a, as a Canon would. Really? I yeah, didn't play with it. that yet. Try it. Play with it. Turn it on. Okay, first we'll turn it on here. And there we go. We're turning it on. Oh, not. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, and it's enormously more usable than oh, the A7S. The A7S with this meta, this is my meta bones yeah. from my A7S. There's yeah. no way that no, works. not at all. Doesn't even come close. So whatever they've done, that technology works a lot better, which is great. So I'm happy about I that. I have no preview. Look at, look at what I shot. <laughs> Hit your display button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, mean, I mean, is that an ease of use issue or is that just a what you're used to, a workflow that you're used to? I mean, I guess I would get to where I take a picture, I quickly look. But you can't. But I can't it's look not very quick enough. because it doesn't write very fast. This card. So the card. This card's got to be faster, right? This I mean, card's I, 80 megabits per second. It 80, is 80, 80 megabits a second. Yep. Yeah, write speed. I will mention that we we chose to use the Canon 50 millimeter 1.2 lens uh, L series lens as our testing lens because it was we didn't think it was fair to use a Canon lens on one and then like a Zeiss Sony lens on another. Zeiss on so the we, we want to really, it's not about the lens, it's about the camera. So we want to make sure that that's, that's identical. Yep. All right, so let's take him outside and let's, uh, let's shoot some images of Spencer. Probably right. the last time we'll have images of Spencer. Yeah. 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 He's moved on uh, to the fire department. So uh, going outside, taking our tripod with us. Why is everything on auto right now? Who is on auto? Okay, so what did we learn? We took them outside, we shot kind of looking at dynamic range, ease of use, and just large images, so. Ease of use, I think the 5D wins. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. Overall image, where it really counts, what do you think? Oh, it's definitely, when I mean, you're looking at this, it's holding the dynamic range much better. When yeah. We showed that sidewalk in the background and the road is blown out in the, in the Canon, but on the Sony, It'll You're, be interesting to see what you can do in post. It'll be really it interesting to see what you can get. Kind of how you can balance the two. Yeah. Uh, one for me that I thought was very interesting was we, we took a shot of Kate. She was a little bit uh, overexposed, maybe by a stop. And on the A7S, she still had some, looked like some pretty good qualities of skin uh, that were, were even in the blown out parts that was retaining some information. I mean, it was where, almost a little pinkish, even in the, in the blown out white. Yeah, yeah, and in the 5D, it was like this chalky yellow. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was gone, and it, it did not look gone. flattering. So I don't know. It's uh, I, you know I'll be really curious to see what they look like when we blow them up and put them on the computer and show them for you guys. Yeah. But uh, what do you think? Post in the comments. Let us know what you guys think. If you have experience with the two cameras, we'd love to know what you, what you, uh, your thoughts were. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. And I mean, it's interesting to me because I think this is is finally the world where you get 4K and stills in the same image. So if the mm -hmm. if the ease of use was just a little. A few things would make this so that I could shoot it as a still camera and feel more comfortable with it. And these even some, there. some software changes that could that could help a lot of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like what we talked yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, I'll do the mod. I think this is a fabulous camera. Yeah. If I used it consistently, maybe I'd make the crossover and, and I could ease of use would be there. But I, it doesn't feel super intuitive. Right. So, but and maybe and maybe what you do is you leave the image preview up 
but then you just have your finger on the trigger so that you can get rid of it almost as But the problem is you can't frame the next shot. Yeah, that you, is a you problem. You cannot frame the next shot. That is a problem. So you're just flying blind. You're shooting in the blind. That so doesn't work. Let me ask you, with it off, were you okay looking through pixels as you took a picture and then you immediately saw pixels? Or, like, was that quick enough for you? Yeah, well, no, I mean, if you're shooting with it off, then you've got to hit the button on the back I know, but with, as you're shooting with it off, were you able to shoot? Oh, yeah, no, no, it's, no problem? it's fine. Yeah, you can shoot as fast as you want. Yeah. But it does have the right speeds are a little slow on this to get it back. Yeah. If you want to preview it, it's a little slow. The Canon was much faster. Yeah, much it was faster. interesting. So, yeah, the right speeds to be able to get an image up to look at it was quite a bit slower on this. And I think that's also a software fix, that as they continue so. to write the software a little bit better, they can figure out how to get those right speeds. Yeah. But it was better. impressive. The uh, autofocus on in the met with the Metabones so, was so way quick. better than the A7S. Yep. Love that. Yep. While we're out with Spencer, we shot a little video just to take a look at that five-axis sensor. Yeah. And what's the word you used? Buttery smooth. Just because you can tell. It's buttery smooth hand handheld. It. Yeah, it just kind of floats a little bit. It's like, it's nice. like a dance. You just... You just <laughs> yeah. Just a nice, nice yeah. little... Ooh. Where's that Marvin Gaye music when you need it? Wow, wow, wow. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Smooth. I've been thinking smooth. about you. You're just like, yeah, give me that buttery smoothness. It's good. That's what the 4K was on that uh, five axis sensor. So there's Trench from the Trenches for the month of September. I uh, hope you enjoyed the things we had today. Remember, we have a podcast as well. We do have a podcast. To. The whole thing. A lot of stuff won't make sense on the podcast because it's just us. <laughs> wow, look at that. Woo, ah. <laughs> like right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but check it out if that's uh, your inclination. And make sure you leave a comment there and tell us how, how much you like it, loved it, and uh, go from there. So keep those cameras rolling. Keep on clicking. See you in October. Okay. We should have a shoot a shootout. A shootout? Yeah. Yeah. Find a, a Sony person that's super great and then say, now give me a 200 ISO with a 5.6 at a 80 <laughs> and see who can get there faster. Who can get there? Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah.